Uh, thank you. Nice to see everybody here. Um, tonight I'm going to do something that's a little bit off the map just to kind of keep myself interested and um, talk a little bit um, about some background um, before I dive into um, my own work. Um, so these two guys, these are not works of my own, needless to say. Um, what I'm going to talk about for a minute is the, this problem of the romantic and the rationalist um, strains in modernism and postmodernism. And the reason it interests me uh, is both intellectually but also because it's a conflict in my own work, um, which we'll look at in a minute. Um, and so the idea is that there's a sort of a, a conflict within modernism between the romantic impulse and the rationalist impulse. And you can construe that in different ways. Um, the Apollonian and the Dionysian after Nietzsche, or left brain, right brain, something like this. But I'm going to go with the romantic and the rational. All right, so in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, when I first got started. Um, I mean, just the, the art world was in a very formal, abstract, and I would now say kind of rationalist phase. Um, so perhaps that was, you know, in, partly in reaction to the abstract expressionists, um, you know, where it, it, in that period of minimalism, and there was also the sort of late modernism of, of Caro and this kind of stuff. Um, there was sort of a, there was a set of prohibitions against gesturalism, personal expression, the kind of totemic or mythic background that the, that the abstract expressionists had been interested in. Surrealism was, was thought of as pretty tacky. And then figuration in general was kind of, um, uh, you know, very subdued current in the art world at that point. Perlstein and, and Katz, of course, were figures, but their figuration was very formal. Okay, so I've taken, you know, as I said, in that period, the idea of the romantic was sort of a dirty word, was sort of a, you know, that, that meant you were kind of soft in the head, um, and you didn't understand what this kind of formal rational, feet on the ground, just the facts kind of art was all about, that what was going on. Um, and I pretty much accepted that at the time with some reservations. Um, about five or six years ago, um, I read a book called The Roots of Romanticism by Isaiah Berlin. And it kind of rearranged my ideas about all that, about the romantic tradition. And since then, I've kind of seen modernism, and this is going back to the 18th century, as a kind of a two-sided coin. And so I picked two exemplars here of the two sides of that coin from the 18th century. So on the right, the fabulous Houdon portrait you have of Francois-Marie Darouet, better known to us as Voltaire, okay, playwright, poet, polemicist, essayist. He's kind of the paradigm of the rationalist um, enlightenment skeptic. Um, he was known for the, the using his satire and his mockery and his wit to uh, undermine the authorities of the day. Um, he was a sexual libertine. Uh, you know, he was attacked for that repeatedly by his enemies in the church and the state and kind of refused to back off on that. Um, parad you know, freedom of speech, personal liberty were his credo. Um, you know, he should be on the letterhead of the ACLU, right? He's that kind of a figure. He was jailed in the Bastille. He was sent into exile several times. Um, and in England, he encounters Newton's work and becomes a fervent advocate of that sort of Im English empiricist rationality, natural science. He's a friend of Franklin's. Um, so he's sort of the icon of the pragmatically engaged, politically engaged rationalism. He's a reformist, um, somebody who thinks that if you could sweep aside the forces of superstition, religion, bias, uh, local, 
you know, parochialism, you could find a set of rational principles and we could all kind of get on the same page and move forward, right? So he's a universalist. He believes that there are universal principles underlying both the physical and the social world. Um, and so, yeah, he's the type of the progressive modernizer. Now, of course, he was no idiot. He wrote Candide, um, which is like a 18th century splatter movie, right? It's like Quentin Tarantino move over. This is just this orgy of irrational violence and Dr. Pangloss standing there saying, well, it's the best of all possible worlds, right? You know, so, so Voltaire didn't have any time for any sort of empty-headed metaphysics either. He was a practically-minded guy. Um, on the left, you've got Johann Gottfried Herder, a less well-known figure, German, student of Kant, later a critic of Kant, advisor to the young Goethe, sort of a proto-romantic proto philosopher, um, wrote a great book on sculpture called Plastique, and this is in the 18th century, um, you know, advocating for the sense of touch as the basis for sculpture over what we would call the optical paradigm, you know, and so that was kind of a bold thing to do in the 18th century. Um, but the main thing was he was a cultural relativist, unlike Voltaire and the Enlightenment um, rationalists, he thought that truth was local, personal, idiosyncratic. It grew up from underneath. He didn't believe in the sort of overarching rationalism that the, that the Enlightenment rationalists um, supported. So he thought of as the founder of anthropology. He's the early version of the idea that every culture is valid on its own terms. There isn't a universal culture. So he's the first folklorist. He writes a book in 1774 called Folks Leader, Folk Songs, first book of folk songs. Nobody had ever bothered to study that before. So he's interested in myth, fairy tale, folk tale, these things that Voltaire would have considered to be just ridiculous, imbecilities, foolishness. Um, and then Berlin's big point is that he's anti-systematic. He doesn't believe that there's an overarching set of principles that are comprehensible to the human mind that explain everything. Um, he, he, does, he, he entertains the possibility that human understanding is limited, that it won't, it maybe just won't all add up. And then the final thing is that he's interested in the idea that sentiment, what he would call sentiment, we would call emotion, precedes cognition or understanding. So in other words, the rationalists always said, oh, well, the passions, emotion, clouds your understanding, make it so you, you can't see the truth. Herder's saying the opposite, no. Emotion, sentiment leads to understanding. And he was particularly interested in morality, so he's saying the moral sentiments lead you to understand right and wrong. All right, so that's the idea of the polarity of these two different ways of looking at things. And you can sort of jump forward um, into, the, into the modern era. I mean, these two forces kind of fight back and forth, one gaining dominance for a while and the other losing, etc. In modernism, um, you know, you can certainly look at the sort of abstract tradition, Mondrian, Corbusier, Donald Judd, and say, well, this is pretty rationalist work. Um, romantic modernism, certainly the Surrealists, Breton, Bataille, um, or more recently something like the Viennese Actionists, you know, people who want to cut a cow open and get in the blood and, you know, make a happening out of all of that. <clears throat> Um, people like Matisse, Giacometti, Rothko, harder to place um, and more interesting to me for that reason. Um, the postmodernism takes certain elements. I've come to see postmodernism really as a continuation of this romantic tradition, but taking certain elements of this romantic tradition to an extreme. Um, particularly the idea of, of, of the local context of culture and these kind of things. Um, and then sort of dodging the bullet altogether in other ways, particularly this problem of empathy, um, affect, um, that so interested Herder. 
All right, so my idea is that Romanticism is, is a deeper current in both the general situation than, than the historical situation that's usually um, thought of. You know, if you like to listen to Muddy Waters more than you like to listen to Mozart, you're over there on the, on the romantic side a little bit. If you think that Jane Jacobs was right, that, that cities grow organically and that what's interesting about a city is the, the organic fact of the neighborhoods growing and responding to each other and you think Robert Moses who wanted to rationalize the city was a disaster and you're also a little bit over there with Herder. And if you think that the, um, you know, the modern idea that the, the uh, rational economic man is a fiction of the Enlightenment um, and that people make consumer decisions on an emotional basis all the time, sometimes against their own economic interest, again, Herder would say, well, of course, you know, what could be more obvious? Um, okay, so that's, that's the idea. Now, if we leap ahead to Robert Taplin, this is in the, in the 70s. Um, I started out really as a constructivist. And so in the mid 70s to the mid late, yeah, this is probably the one on the left, 76 there over on Ward's Island. The other one's maybe 1980, the last one I did. These were big geometric kinetic uh, constructions that moved in the wind. Um, I was interested in people like Calder and Ricky and DeSouvro. Um, they were all still around working, but they were a lot older than I was. So this was a sort of a retro modernism at, the, at that point in the 70s. You know, at the 70s, you know, the whole sort of experimental thing of conceptualism and performance was already rolling along. But this is what I was interested in. Um, in 1977, a friend of mine, Daniel Wolf, a poet, and I got together. We decided to do a collaborative project and he came up, we, we worked with a bunch of different ideas, and he eventually came up with this sort of scheme, which was a, a ballad, a short poem, and we made nine of these things. Um, we called them viewers, and they were set out around the streets of New Haven for a month in 1977. Um, and the idea was that there was a first-person narrator, who we called the viewer maker, and he had made these things as memorials to um, the locations where the events of an, a sort of imaginary or perhaps real affair with a woman had occurred. And um, so this was the seventh one. It's really a bus stop. Those people really are waiting for the bus. I took the, we took the bus stop sign down and put it on the sculpture. They were hand cranked and you looked inside and there was moving parts and uh, sort of a landscape tableau of people crossing a street at night. And the little poem that was in this one said, I was standing here while the city passed. In one of its windows, I saw her face. I rode the buses all day long. She was every place. And then the refrain was, this is the place it happened here. So the idea was that this sort of little romance, a romantic story, became a little bit of an allegory for the city. Um, and you could ride around the city and see all nine of these things, which people used to do. This is another one. I like this one on the left because it's like, where's the sculpture? Well, it's that little rusty box hanging on the light pole there. Um, so these things merged with the city. They almost looked like they, they belonged there. They were meant to be there, but they'd had this crank hanging off of them. So people would go up and say, what the hell is this? and crank it and look in it. On the right is the interior of one that was outside a, a, a sort of funky dollar department store called King's. It was early in the story of the second one. It said, I saw her first at the end of an aisle. There were bargains everywhere. The closer she came, the clearer it seemed. All I wanted was her. All right, so this is a, one more. This is the fourth one. This was on Dixwell Avenue, and this one, you, you pumped the thing. You stood up there and you pumped, you know, started this pump treadle, and the uh, bicycle wheel started to rotate, and you were looking through the spokes, and there's this little guy lying there in the bed. 
and then a window shade came up and blocked your view, and the poem was on that. And it said, she and I, we'd giddy up all around and stop for air, and just when I thought I had her there, she'd ask if I owned a car. And on the back, it's sort of scribbled on the wall. This is the place it happened here. All right, so these pieces, of course, were completely opposite from what I'd been doing, and in every, in, certainly in contrast to the sort of rationalist um, abstract tradition that I'd been working with, they were romantic in every way. Um, figurative, narrative, um, engaging, participatory, vernacular, um, and about a romance. Um, so I spent the next, after this project was very successful, went to New York under the um, auspices of the Public Art Fund and was um, shown as Welcome to New Haven. We built this arcade and that big sign up there said Welcome to New Haven. You'd get off the subway at 14th Street and there's this thing that said Welcome to New Haven. And there was another sign in there that said inside this city there's another city. And they were all in there for a month. Um, and that was also very successful. It was written up in the voice and whatnot. So um, I was in this position of a sort of schizophrenic, um, one part of me going one way and the other part of me going the other way. And I spent the next six or seven years trying to sort of sort this out. Um, what happened was I went back to constructivism and started making these constructivist sculptures that had a sort of landscape or figure hidden in them. Um, they were sort of a halfway house between abstraction and representation. So this one was called Salila Falls. This one was called Salisbury Plain. Um, a sort of, in my own mind, a kind of mythic background. Um, then the figure started to actually emerge out of the construction and started to take on its own um, recognizable attributes. This one was called Chihuahua. Um, so, of course, I was very interested in, in African, West African tribal art as this classic, again, modern locus of uh, that abstract um, figurative uh, barrier or... or um, yeah. Um, so then by 1985, it just came all the way up to being figures. So this was called the Coles in 1985. And I spent about a year doing this because this is, is forged. Uh, this is not cast. This is made by hammering the steel pipes into, into shape. And what's important about this in retrospect um, was at the time, I didn't think about as if I was going back to some 19th century naturalism. Um, I thought of it as putting the flesh back on a modern sculpture. Um, you know, the constructivist sculpture is axial. Um, you know, the, the, the pipes are, are either an internal axis or the, or the edge of a volume. Um, and this was as if I'd put the meat back on it. Um, but they were still, as far as I was concerned, completely modern sculpture, somewhat in the constructivist tradition. They're direct. They weren't cast. They're very tripodic. They hold themselves up. They don't have a base or a pedestal. Um, they're still very angular, uh, you know, constructed the way a spatial construction like a Desuvro or a Caro. Life-size. They're tinsel. They have that tinsel quality of steel. And, um, and then they're pretty much deep in a sort of surrealist dream. Okay, so there were a group of these. On the left, the source. And on the right, walk like a man, heavy sledding. Um, so these are full scale figures. So the one on the, you know, the piece on the right is whatever, eight feet tall. Um, they're very slow. Um, there were about seven of these, but it was interesting because since they are made by direct forging of the steel, they, um, they're self-supporting. There's no armature. You're not moving a volume of clay around until you get to the place you want and then molding it and casting it. You're moving a membrane in and out until you find the spot. 
and they were also open to enormous changes at the last minute. You could take the nearly completed figure and just cut a piece of it off with a torch. I don't like that hand. I'll just cut it off, rework it, and put it on. Or more interestingly still, you could adjust the balance of the thing in a small way by just snipping a little bit out from the knee and bending it a little bit more. Um, so they were weirdly flexible in a way that more traditional uh, kinds of work are not. Um, so somewhere in there, a friend of mine and I, we bought a small foundry or a bronze melder and started casting. Um, so here I started going to modeling with wax by hand. Again, trying to keep it very direct, um, modeling the pieces, investing them straight into the ceramic investment and burning them out and casting them. So no intermediary mold. Um, so they were very fresh and direct, but you know, eventually, of course, got involved in molding. Um, so again, there was sort of a, uh, there were a lot of these. Uh, this one is uh, Burning Monk Drowning Baby. Very small. These were all on what I thought of as a votive scale, handheld, six inch tall figure, something you could you know, pick up in your hand. Diane Arbus at a nudist colony. Starting to think a lot about the, the, the viewer and the viewed, who's looking and who's getting looked at. And then the scale getting a little bit bigger, burn. Starting to look a lot at um, uh, photojournalism and and pulling things out of that out of that uh, of that world. The stunt. Starting polychrome, still very small figures. These things are six inches high. All right. So this is this is sort of moving through the '80s, um, and you know, again, the background of the '80s is neo-expressionism, of course, and you know, there were sort of two angles going on in that period um, as the figurative thing started to kind of come back. Um, one angle was the expressionists, mostly Italian, German, and they were taking a sort of what I felt was kind of a generic expressionist point of view um, in which you know expressionism is this thing where you where you try and create the illusion that the actual marks of the fabrication of the painting or the sculpture are the record of the artist's psychological state and so the, the idea is that you the viewer are looking at this thing that's like a residue of the artist's psychological state at the time. Of course, it's an illusion, but that's, that's sort of what the expressionist work strives for. Um, the other group were what Jeff Wall brilliantly called iconophobes, as in f people who were afraid of the image. Um, and so that was Cindy Sherman and all, uh, people who felt th that the the basis for representation was entirely questionable and that representations were by and large some sort of a lie, some sort of a um, shuck and that, that the artist's job was to unmask the representation, present it in its fraudulence, its, its falsity. Um, neither of those approaches interested me very much. Um, there were a few people who were maybe working a, a line that interested me more, um, perhaps early Eric Fischel, certainly Leon Golub, um, and, and that was the idea of actually take, trying to take the image seriously for what it might do. Um, and this, you know, in retrospect, uh, falls into line with Herder's idea that the emotion, the affect of the work could actually lead you to some understanding. That was a position that was then and is still highly distrusted, certainly in the New York art world, um, but I think goes some ways to explain the sort of affectless, um, dry quality of a great deal of postmodernism. Um, 
Okay, so 87, interestingly enough, this guy on the left, Wall, Jeff Wall wrote this interesting article about Stefan Balkenhall, a German on the left, woodcarver, um, and he said, oh, well, these things are, are he called them um, count, a counter-experimental form. He said these things are, are presented as a statue which is there to challenge the status or the validity of the experimental forms of the 70s, conceptualism, performance, etc. cetera. Um, and he said they were like, he called them monads. He said they were like people who had just come out of the hospital. They, they, they looked like they could stand up and get dressed but couldn't do much else. Um, so within the context of figuration, this was certainly still well within a rationalist program of, in effect, critiquing the recent art world. Um, Wall said, interestingly, that there was a little romantic touch in these things in that there was a little bit of the identification of the figure with the tree it was carved out of. And it's true, the Balkan Halls, you know, the base there is the, is the block of wood and he's carved back to the figure. And there's a, that's a little bit of truth to that, but it's pretty, it's pretty tentative. Um, on the right, you have James Searles. Okay, here you've got full-blown romantic identification of the figure with the tree it's carved out of, right? <laughs> um, you know, so Searles, regional, vernacular, working with folk forms, totally personal, idiosyncratic, kind of trippy, sort of stoned. Um, this interested me much more. And again, um, this was, was pretty full-fledged romanticism, although I wouldn't have really recognized it as such at the time. Um, nevertheless, the 80s kind of came to an end and um, you know, the art market crashed in 89. I was, had very little participation in the market, so that didn't affect me much. But it did sort of change the, the drift of things. And there was a sense of kind of pulling out of the neo-expressionist world. Um, and my feeling was, uh, it was sort of, yeah, time to sort of pull out of the mythic mists, the kind of surreal dream I'd been working in. and and work with something a little more objective. Um, so this is a piece, I switched to a fully traditional method, right, making the pieces in clay, making plaster waste molds, and casting them in concrete. So, uh, and they were exactly half scale. Um, so this piece is called, the, the body is a frail leaf, but the mind is a fortress. So there was kind of a residual narrative going on in here, but it's a whole lot more objective, rationalized um, than before. Um, the pieces got more that way. I started working with double portraits. And this, at the end of the day, the idea of objectifying or rationalizing what you're doing, for me, almost had to do with the simple fact of bringing somebody else into the studio. Instead of making everything out of yourself, all those steel pieces were both made both by looking at myself, but also you know self-generated. This was like bring somebody else into the studio and look at somebody else. Um, and so I spent quite a few years doing this. Um, these double portraits uh, had a lot of the this problem of who's looking and who's being looked at and uh, very involved with the whole problem of positioning the viewer. Where does the viewer stand vis-a-vis -vis the sculpture? Um, and in this case, the figure is exactly half scale, the head's exactly twice life scale, and of course the table is life scale, and so are you standing there in front of it. Um, so it forces you, the viewer, to kind of assemble the work for yourself. You have to kind of put it together. It doesn't seem to have a natural unity or cohesiveness, although it's pretty carefully designed. There's also sort of a filmic feeling of zooming in and out into, you know, the big head advances at you and the small figure seems to retreat. 
all the nails, Bob. These things also had, you know, this very uh, heightened presence. So again, in terms of, although the, the format was very objectifying and sort of rationalizing, the, um, the figures and the heads themselves uh, presented you with a very aggressive presence. Then I tried a different kind of double portrait, two sculptures of the same figure, I mean, two, yeah, of, the, of the same person, although, I mean, I suppose this could be twins. There's also, this is called Haida Twice, though. Um, there's a sense of, is it a sequence? Did she have her clothes on and then she took her clothes off? Um, and again, there's, the, the, the thing here is, uh, uh, sort of sly discussion again of the gaze. Uh, there was a lot of talk about the male gaze at that point and the problem of the nude. Um, Balkenhall, Wall in his article about Balkenhall said, you know, the new, uh, these, these new figures, none of them can be nude because it's referring to the traditional past in a way that just won't cut it. But I was interested in why that was. And so in this piece, you have this situation where the one with the clothes on is sort of sexy and dreamy, and she's got her eyes closed, and you get to look at her. The nude is sitting there with her eyes open, looking like she's waiting in a doctor's waiting room to go for an appointment. And so she's very protected in a way, and I, and I was just you know, messing with that. Um, I did some more tableaus at that point, um, but they too got a lot more objective, um, uh, cooled off. So this is the reenactment. This is the test. So again, although the format is, co is cool and removed, the, the presence is, is, is pretty strong. Okay, and then around 2000, I started working on this project, The Five Outer Planets, and I guess this was the first point where I started thinking, well, maybe I can sort of put this all together. And of course, I wasn't thinking it in the terms I'm talking about it now, but in retrospect, it seems kind of obvious. You know, this was, the idea was this was The Five Outer Planets. This was a shot of three of them at Smack, the old Smack Mellon in Brooklyn. And the idea was to take the five outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, and take some of the physical, rational data about the planets, their, their comparative sizes, their distances from one another, the idea of the light side and the dark side, um, and certain other things about their rotation and whatnot, and crossbreed that with the mythological story that their names refer to, which is the Greco-Roman um, myth of origins, and it turns out the five planets are a family group, right? So Jupiter is the big guy there on the left, is the current boss, the man in charge. Saturn, behind him there on the right, is his father. Uranus, who's tumbling along there farther to the right, is his grandfather. And Neptune here is one of his brothers. And Pluto, way up high there, is another one of his brothers. Um, and it's the, the, the story is this brutal story of the successions of generations where each, each generation basically overcomes the generation before and either ties it up or castrates it or whatever and, and pushes it aside until you finally get uh, Jupiter in charge. Um, and it's, this, it's a crazy mythic story um, which I sort of buried in these figures. Um, it was amazing in Smack Mellon, because the old Smack Mellon had an almost 50 foot high ceiling. So when you came in below, you were faced with the big Jupiter, and Pluto, the god of the underworld, was you know 40 feet up in the air in the dark there, and he really drifted. So this was a f fun show. So. Recently, um, I had a show down at the Grounds for Sculpture in um, New Jersey, 
and this is what the planets looked like down there. You can see them a little bit more in their succession, the idea that they're getting smaller and farther away as they go back. Look, looked great down there because they have this, you know, again, almost 30-foot ceiling. All right, now, the, the other two um, series that I'm going to show you a little bit of somewhat are more what I've been working on in the last 10 years, and they are more this sort of, more of this same kind of uh, idea of trying to um, kind of find a sweet spot uh, in between some of these romantic impulses and some of the more sort of rational principles. So the Punchinello is this figure um, from Com Commedia dell'arte, and I, um, you know, I encountered, I'd always been interested in punch, punch and Judy, puppets, masks, this sort of thing, this sort of non-naturalistic tradition. Um, but then I encountered the, the uh, group of uh, drawings by Tiepolo, the younger, I can never remember which is which, I guess he's Giovanni, um, who, who did the, a set of a hundred and some drawings of a sort of society of Punchinellos. Um, and it, this is the Napoleonic era, you know, turn of the 19th century, and so um, some of them are hilarious and some of them get really weird. You know, Punch gets taken out in a firing squad at one point and stuff. Um, and I just thought, this is great. It's this opening for a sort of social satire, but also just a way to insert this surrogate figure into contemporary life and, and, and use it as you will. Um, so another sort of reference would probably be Goya's Caprichos. Another, you know, Goya, another one of these incredible artists who came out of the Enlightenment. He was definitely an Enlightenment man, but who had this, you know, incredible theatrical, affective, romantic in its own way side to him. Oh, this is Punch Makes a Public Confession. These were up above the planets down in Grounds for Sculpture, which was great. Um, this is Punch Does a Magic Trick. So these, the figures are about 10 inches high and they're cast in a resin, a sort of a cloudy white resin that's hard to focus on. They have a sort of slippery, soft surface. Uh, the young Punch scratches his burrow's ears. So I got very involved with the idea of the young Punch. What was Punch's childhood? Punch receives a prize. Not sure, maybe academic, but I'm not sure. It seems to be a liberty prize, although Punch is more known for taking liberties than protecting liberty. But it's, uh, again, it's, and this is, again, a sort of ancien regime, 18th century ambiance, as if this character from an earlier era had somehow stumbled into our own era. Punch attends a premiere. And they also obviously refer to that whole tradition of the, um, you know, the figurine, the little 18th century ceramic figurine. Punch stopped at the border. He's got his puppets and his bowling pins and stuff in those suitcases. The young Punch watches TV with the maids. So there's the possibility that Punch had a privileged but somewhat lonely childhood. All right, so I got to do a big one. This was done for the Aldrich Museum. Um, so this is a fiberglass enlargement of the young Punch goes shopping with his mother. And the deal here is it's about eight feet tall, so it's over life size on this sort of base, like a sort of faux monument. Um, so this engages a little bit some of those ideas of the, of the trustworthiness of the representation. But again, within a sort of fabric of fairly strong emotional affect, um, you know, the idea here is the young Punch, well, he's different, but he doesn't really know it yet. But his mother is concerned. And so when you first, first, 
look at it in the daytime, it seems solid, looks almost like it's stone or something, and then it's actually got internal lighting, and so as the dusk comes down, it starts to glow like it does on the right there. And then when it gets really dark, it turns into just sort of a, a beaming sign. So again, this is, has reversal of expectations, the thing going from solid to sort of clearly just a membrane. Um, this is the way it looked down in um, Grounds for Sculpture. I don't think they've been shopping down there, but maybe, I don't know. It doesn't look like mom's kind of place. I also, at Grounds for Sculpture, this was really fun. I got to do a digital enlargement for the first time. So this piece um, is uh, Punches Homeless. And they took a 10-inch maquette and scale, you know, scanned it and scaled it up for me. And I got 17 pieces of carved foam back, which I assembled. And uh, Hermana Costa over here helped me sand them all down and put a new skin on them and put them all back together again. So this is the only piece I've done in a long, long time that's not cast, although it's a form of a reproduction of a casting. And it has that quality, the washed out, um, soft look to it. And the idea here is that Punch, Punch is not looking for your sympathy. He's, he can take care of himself. Here it looks like he, he may be going shopping in this case, or at least go root around in the dumpsters, I don't know. All right, and so the last thing is this um, set of pieces that I did um, that were shown at Winston Walker years ago, and then were up at Mass Mocha, and then were part of the show down at uh, Grounds for Sculpture in New Jersey. And this was a set of nine pieces called um, Everything Imagined is Real After Dante. And I took nine excerpts from Dante's Inferno, medieval text, and again, use them as a springboard to try and reimagine the story in a more personal, idiosyncratic way in, within a sort of contemporary setting. And so they took three formats, and they're all three of them in a row here. All the way down on the left, the, the, the sculpture sits out on an open table. There were two of those. And then the next one is a kind of dollhouse format with a flat floor, um, the figures and the tables and everything else sit in there in real space, so to speak. You know, square is square, flat is flat, true is true. And then on the right, this more kind of um, operatic, you know, rake stage opera set format um, with a forced perspective. Um, and they all had their own, except for the ones that were out on the tables, had their own kind of internal lighting. So they're in this diorama format. Um, so again, this is a sort of backward looking format. The diorama is something we associate with, with the uh, Natural History Museum, um, whatever. Uh, it, it is a, uh, it's a, you know, it again forces the viewer to accept the framing and the presentation as it is. It doesn't allow the viewer a lot of liberty or freedom. Um, but it, it sets up a situation where you can create this intense um, theatricality. So there were nine of these, and each one was associated with a, a short section of the Dante's poem, which I'm just going to kind of read. So this is the first one. It was called, Thus My Soul, Which Was Still in Flight, The Dark Wood. And as he who with laboring breath has escaped from the deep to the shore turns to gaze at the churning waters, thus my soul, which was still in flight, turned back to look again at the past which had never let any go alive. So this is Dante leaping out of bed in the middle of the night having a nightmare. And his wife is sleeping on quietly there next to him. Now the deal in this series was that the, one of the jokes in Dante is that everybody's dead except for him. So everybody's always looking at him and saying, what are you doing here? You're still alive, you know? And 
So in my series, Dante, who's the fellow here in the yellow shirt, is polychromed, and everybody else is in a monochrome of some sort because they're dead. They're ghosts. Um, so this is the second one where Dante's lost in the dark wood, and, and um, Beatrice, who is his sort of heavenly protectress, sends Virgil, the ancient Roman poet, to go get him. And so in this scene, which was you know, a sort of a very careful quarter scale reproduction of my house in West Haven. Um, you have Dante's, well, Virgil looks like sort of Dante's cool Italian uncle who's come to visit, or maybe his grandfather or something. And they're sort of talking it over. And um, the quote was, well, it's called, She Turned Away, Beatrice Sends Virgil to Dante. When she had told me this, she turned away her shining eyes, filled with tears, which made me more full of haste to come to you as she wished. So Beatrice is sending Virgil. There's some sense that it could just be Dante sleeping and imagining his grandparents or his parents talking him over or something. You know, there's a sense of, as we say, it may all be imaginary. This is the third one where they cross the river Asheron into hell. Virgil is now taking Dante with him. It's called Across the Dark Waters, the River Asheron. And so they go forth over the dark waters, and before they arrive over there, a new crowd gathers over here. So the souls are stacking up, trying to get across the river. And I've kind of construed it as a refugee scene. There are over a hundred figures in this thing, and they have a kind of crazy luminosity to them with the light that's on them. So, um, and then this steep forced perspective. Then the fourth one is called, I saw the master, Limbo. When I raised my eyes a little higher, I saw the master. And so this is Dante at home, and suddenly he sees somebody coming through the door. And it's David Smith, the sculptor, with one of his anti-war sculptures from the 30s in his arm called Golden Specter Riding the, oh no, uh, War Specter Riding the Golden Ass. Once more, Karen, what is it? Specter Riding the Golden Ass. The fifth one is, I saw shadows coming, the second circle. And as the cranes go, chanting their lays, making of themselves a long line, so I saw shadows coming, carried on that wind, trailing their drawn out cries. This is the famous one where the, the lustful are going around in a huge circle of wind, and Paolo and Francesca come talk to Dante. But I've kind of reconfigured it as it just looking out into the backyard and there are these three airplanes coming overhead um, with these little red lights on. Sense that something is terribly wrong or maybe nothing's wrong at all. The sixth one is called Recognize Me If You Can, the third circle. Oh, you who were led through this hell, recognize me if you can. You were made before I was unmade. So in Dante, this is the, the uh, gluttonous, but I've sort of reversed most things, so these people are more likely starving, I guess. The seventh one is called One Nation Rules, Fortune. So that one nation rules and another languishes according to the judgment of that one who lies hidden like a snake in the grass. So this is sort of the apogee of the violence of this piece where things are just spinning out of control. Um, one of the important things in Dante is that sometimes you see Dante in the, in the poem and sometimes you see what he sees. So this is a continuation of this problem about who, who is the viewer? Are you an observer or a participant or the personification of part of the poem itself? Um, so this is one of the ones where we're clearly seeing what he sees. And in fact, we haven't seen Dante for a while at this point in the series. In the eighth one, he comes back. So here's Dante again. 
This one is called Get Back, the River Styx. Then he grabbed the boat with both hands, but Virgil quickly pushed him off, saying, Get back with the other dogs. So this is a very high pedestal. You're kind of down there in the water with a guy who's trying to climb in. And, uh, you know, Virgil's kind of pushing the guy off. And it sort of gives you that feeling like, wow, if he gets in the boat, I'm coming right in after him. And so by this time, there's this feeling in the series that you as the viewer, certainly Dante is implicated in the whole situation, and, and maybe you are as well. And then the last one is called, We Went In Without a Fight Through the Gates of Dis. We went in without a fight, and I was eager to see, and I, who was eager to see what was within such a stronghold, as soon as we were inside, cast my eyes about, and at every hand I saw a great plain full of torment and pain. So Dante's going in by himself here. Virgil's leaving him behind, or staying behind. There are these stars overhead, so there's sort of a feeling you might get out of this alive, but it's this ruined city, um, and Dante's sort of going in alone, um, So, which is kind of a compression of the way the actual poem works, but the actual poem has 33 cantos, and I was no way going to do 33 of these things, so we kind of <laughs> brought, brought things back a little bit tighter. Um, so anyway, that, this project, as I said, is, 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 in my feeling, has sort of been the most successful thing I've done at this point in terms of trying to drive these concerns together with a, with a certain, they have a certain objectivity about them, but also this uh, attempt to use a kind of forthright um, affect, uh, literary qualities, narrative, etc. Um, to draw the viewer in um, to an imaginative space that I'm, that I'm interested in creating, um, even though I'm maybe not giving the viewer a tremendous amount of liberty within that space. You, you, you do get to really enter these things if you let yourself go. Um, they, they, especially the ones with the forced perspective, they, they draw you in pretty, 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 pretty sharply. All right, that's it. Thank you.